What's good kings and queens? This week's video is on when someone's oh, gotta go. So pretty much a high stakes bout between two undefeated fighters. With that being said, let's start the video. The 23 year old 30 and 0 Robert Garcia was making his first defense of his IBF super featherweight title against 12 and 0 Ramon Ledon. The fight picked up quick after a stalemate first round when Ledon landed the first significant shot of the fight then to fall up and knock Garcia down. Garcia will be on the defensive the whole round and survive to go to the third. The third round was rather even with both guys scoring. Ledon looking a bit tired coming into the fourth round and Garcia took full advantage and began to pick Ladon apart, tying up the knockdown count at the end of the fourth round. Nothing left in the tank and still bothered by the knockdown in the round before, Ladon had to take a knee and recoup himself from Garcia's early round flurries. After getting up and putting up quite of an effort to get Garcia off him, Garcia was able to pick him off and finish the fight with the KO. The 27-0 David Tua was matched up against the underdog 16-0 Ike Biabuchi. This fight was for the WBC international title. This was one of the roughest heavyweight fights from the last 25 years. A real grinder from round one and on. Ike would win the early rounds and Tua would tie things up in the middle of the fight. Why is he talking about soccer? Tua did get in a couple of shots, his best shots of the fight so far. And Biabuchi answers with left hooks of his own. But Ike will finish the fight strong to sweep Tua on the cards and win by a narrow unanimous decision. What a set of power punches by Tua. And he's hurt. Here he comes. Here comes Tua at the end of a fight once more. Just as he did against Mascaya and his son Rete. Tua cleaning out the kitchen in round hooks of left hook by Tua. And Tua again. And again. New. This was a regional belt unification between 14-0 Lennox Lewis, the EBU champion, and 35-0 Gary Mason, the British champion. Both amazing heavyweights, and there was a lot on the line coming in for this fight on who will be the front runner in British heavyweight boxing alongside contender Frank Bruno. No, I don't think we've got any reason to shake hands. No, I don't want to shake his hand. But I'll stretch out my hand anyway. Well, his hand out. <laughs> Gary Mason coming in as a slight favorite to beat Lewis. Despite not being in the top 10 rankings by Ring Magazine, Gary was ranked number 5 by the WBC. In order for Lewis to move up to get a shot at the title, he must get past Gary. When I get really mad, I just look at this picture and see a smile on Mason's face holding up the belt. Well, I'm going to wipe that smile off his face and take away that belt because that belt's mine. Gary getting the better of Lewis early on, landing the first significant shot of the fight in the second round to win it. The third round, it turns into a slugfest with Gary getting much better of the exchanges to clearly win it. Though Lewis was getting outpointed and outpunched by Gary, Lewis was landing the jab at a high percentage to where Gary's eye was messed up completely by the final 30 seconds of the third. As the eye worsens, it forces Mason to be more on the offensive, pressing the fight, expending energy as Lewis slowly pecks away to where Mason's eye is in awful shape. In round seven, Mason now very desperate, knowing the fight may come to an end, lets out one big flurry on Lewis where both guys are going toe to toe. This is going to have to be brought to an end in a minute, but Mason is having one last desperate go in round seven. Once the first initiated hold came in after Mason's flurry, the ref got a good look at the eye during the break and immediately waved the fight off. TKO win for Lennox Lewis. 
Due to an unfortunate technicality, this fight was not for the undisputed title. This fight was between the obvious best in the weight class, 43-0 Joe Calzaghe and 39-0 Mikel Kessler. Calzaghe held the WBO title, making his 21st defense, and Kessler was the WBC and WBA champion. Early to mid rounds, it was even, both guys getting the best of each other. Calzaghe made game-changing adjustments to take over the fight and beat Kessler by a unanimous decision. The fighting pride of Newbridge Wales. Now, the undisputed super middleweight champion of the world! 24-0, Sean Porter, the IBF champion making his second defense against 32-0 Kel Brook. Porter ranked at number 4 and Brook at number 5. According to December 31st, 2013's rankings, Brook was ranked at number 4 and Porter was ranked at number 6. Porter did beat Devin Alexander for the IBF title in December, but the fact that Brook was ranked at number 4 and had not lost yet, his rankings should not have been affected to drop coming into 2014. This fight was a very rough nail-biter for the two. Not a pretty start for Brook as as Porter's rough style caused a clash of heads in the second round, cutting Brook. Porter himself will get cut later in the fight. Though Porter was getting the better of Brook in the first half, Brook started to take over in the second half as Porter started to tire out, making the fight incredibly close to where who wins the championship rounds wins the fight. Since Brook is not American and he's fighting Porter in his backyard of the United States, the UK commentators coming into the 12th round expressed their lack of confidence that Brook will not even make it out with a win on the cards. I have a feeling Kel Brook's not going to get it here, but it's a, it's a performance of comparable quality. Kel Brook will win by a majority decision to become champion. The Sky Sports crew was absolutely shocked that their guy was given a fair shake on the scorecards to get the victory. And the new... It's Kel Brook! It's Kel Brook's night! Just look at that reaction! 67-0 Julio Cesar Chavez against 44-0 Alberto Cortez. Rather entertaining when it lasted. Cortez was landing, but his shots had no effect on Chavez, and every shot Chavez landed moved Cortez. And in the third round, Chavez lands a brilliant combination dropping Cortez. Cortez was unable to make the count, and Chavez goes 68-0. <laughs> It did not take long at all for Mayweather to set up one of the biggest fights to start the decade off against rising Mexican star Canelo Alvarez. Mayweather came in at 44-0 as a WBA junior middleweight champion, making his first defense of the title after throwing Miguel Cotto a year prior. Though Canelo officially on paper was 42-0, he claimed that 8 plus of his fights were not counted on his resume. This claim was made before the US debut against Jose Miguel Cotto in 2010, so unofficially he was coming in with a record of 50-0 or above. This was Canelo's seventh defense of the WBC title and first defense of the Ring Magazine title. Due to Canelo's lack of experience and weapons in his arsenal to get to Floyd, he showed some success with having Floyd bite on feints and establishing a jab that would go under look. This was not even close to what was needed to get the best of Floyd, who won each tactical exchange. As mentioned in my previous video, this was a round where Canelo was on top just barely, based on punch count, what was landed, and effective aggression. Floyd, who counts his shots and his opponent's shots, calculated he had enough time to take an educated risk and outpoint Canelo and steal the round, which he did with absolute precision. Floyd, knowing he just stole the round, goes back into a defensive position and laterally evades Canelo to the bell rings. This was a bit of an unexpected matchup as everyone was hyping up that Edison Miranda was going to make the next big middleweight matchup against Jermaine Taylor. A fight between two young in their prime fighters, which unfortunately Taylor had not had chance to have a fight like that since becoming champion. Pavlik was able to upset Miranda to be in line to fight Jermaine Taylor next. Kelly Pavlik has a huge knockout victory. 
Since Pavlik was undefeated at 31-0 from Youngstown, Ohio, this became a great promotion coming in for boxing fans from Ohio and the Northeast that were nostalgic of the idea of maybe a new champion from Youngstown, which the Atlantic City venue on fight day was flooded with Ohio fans accompanied with two Youngstown legends, Harry Arroyo and Ray Boom Boom Mancini. Jermaine Taylor came in the fight with the record of 27-0, making the fifth defense of the middleweight title. After a lackluster second half performance against Kasim Uma and bad matchup against Corey Spinks, Taylor was hungry to make a statement in practically Kelly Pavlik's adopted backyard of Atlantic City. Taylor started the fight very fast, literally throwing a big right hand at the three second mark in the fight. Taylor in the second round would drop Pavlik on a barrage of flush shots that should have had any other person besides Pavlik that night done. Pavlik will get up with ease, but Taylor is taking no chances takes the risk and expends a lot of energy trying to get Kelly out of there. Pavlik would survive the round. Taylor in the third round was showing clear signs of fatigue. Pavlik seeing that immediately jumps on Taylor, raking in points. Pavlik has tactically controlled this round and now he lands a big combination and backs Taylor off. Tremendous combination. Pavlik trying to find the damaging right hand. Straight Taylor with lefts and rights. Taylor was able to rally and get Pavlik off him, but it was not enough to win the round. Jermaine looks much better the next round, outboxing and landing great shots on Pavlik, but Kelly is slowly grinding away at Taylor, as his shots and pressure is having more effect on Taylor. After back and forth action, the sixth round, Taylor having the best round offensively since the first two, but it took a huge toll in the process. And in the final minute of the seventh round, Kelly set up a perfect shot, stunning him to later stop him and become the middleweight champion. This fight was for the IBF super middleweight title. Tony was 44-0 and Roy came in at 26-0. Tony came in as a 6-5 favorite because he had the far better resume compared to Roy Jones at that time. Tony thinking he could get Roy by coming in as heavy as possible using his weight advantage and bully Roy coming in at 184 pounds on fight day, which ended up being a huge tactical error as Roy was way too fast for Tony. The weight disadvantage was not even apparent as Roy came in at 178 pounds. Roy dominated the fight to win by a wide unanimous decision. Tony in a little bit of trouble. Showboating by Jones. The attempt fade, I think. Left hook, and down goes Tony. After Lopez's brilliant performance rising up to the occasion to beat Vasil Lomachenko, become the unified champion, his first opponent was IVF mandatory George Kambosis. This fight's date got dragged out and dragged out due to inner politics in Lopez's camp. Lopez came down with COVID and the fight was postponed for a second time due to Lopez. And I'm not even sure if it's true, but apparently he was asking for more money. Someone in the comments need to confirm that. Ultimately, the network had enough after spending $10 million so far promoting the event. The Zone picks up the fight, but both fighters earn less due to that. Lopez went from making $2.8 million after the promoter fees to $2.27 million. So after all that, yeah, the records. Lopez is 16-0 and George is 19-0. Outside of the silly drama leading up to the fight, it was definitely forgiven for the amazing performance we saw from these two. Absolute nail biter to the beginning to the end. Cambosa, the heavy underdog, made it out victorious by a close split decision win. And on top of that, this is when someone's O has got to go. For more installments, be sure to like, share, if you're new, subscribe. Subscribe to the Patreon for patron back projects. This project being on the tale of Vasil Lomachenko versus Teofimo Lopez. I'm Alfa Sancho, and I'm out. <laughs>